Good morning. How are you today? A bit cold? Yeah? Or the heat is coming from inside? Yeah? All right. So, um, as we've just been told, my name is Jonathan Mwangi. Uh, and um, I'm a lecturer at the United States International University, Africa, or USIU Africa, as it's popularly to, uh, called. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, it's uh, located on Thika Road, just behind Safari Park. Um, and um, I am a lecturer of a discipline known as medical biochemistry. And I teach uh, mostly students who are doing uh, medical and biomedical courses, so like medicine, like pharmacy. Um, so that's why I teach. But today we're not going to do to learn about biochemistry. Today we want to learn about having a name. Okay, self-determination, also known as self-identity. So. It making a name for yourself. So, what's your name, sir? Ian. So, what does Ian mean? Any idea? Or, or put it in another way. Who is Ian? How do you describe yourself? I describe myself as in, indispicable. Yeah, wow. Right. And my friend here? Mika. 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 Yes. So who is Mika? One name that would describe Mika. Mm. One adjective. Confidential. Mm. Confident. And a lady? Yep. Mm. Go. Tell us your name. And then one adjective that would describe you. Eunice. that might describe this. Jovial. Jovial. Great. So, now, today, we want to find out how do you get that name, that identity? How do you start making a name so that people can always say, well, Ian is polite. Ian is ambitious. Ian is a go-getter. Mika is very polite. Or we can go the other way and then people start saying, well, you mean Mika? That very rude boy. Or that very rude man. Okay? Or you mean Rebecca? That very shabby lady. Okay? So let's find out how we go um, managing to create an identity for ourselves, managing to create something that determines who we are. Okay, and we're going to do this pretty quickly. And I want to start with a quote that was put out by a, by a very young boy at the age of 15. And he said that a part of our identity is knowing, so there are three parts, knowing who we are, okay? So that's one. Now the second part is knowing what we want, okay? And then the third part is knowing when to do the right thing. Once you know those three things, who you are, who you want, and when to do the right thing, then you discover your identity. So how is self-discovery, self-identity linked to where we are in our lives? Now, I think, apart from a few exceptions, who are probably um, our facilitators, we are all teenagers, right? No? Is that correct? We are all teenagers, right? 
And identity, or the biggest bit of our identity starts at this age. That's when we start discovering who we are, what we want, and even when to do the right thing. So I want us to remember those three things as we go through self-discovery, self-determination, self-identity. Okay? And the question that everybody starts asking at this age is, who am I? So who am I? It's not just in the name that you're called by. It's not just Ian. It's not just Mika. There is something bigger. It's who you are, what you want, and when you do, when you know that you need to do the right thing, that determines your identity. Okay, and I'll tell you something. The question of who you are. Even when once once you start getting it, it does not stop. Even when you're older. Okay. And the biggest, the main reason why that is, is that as we go through life, even at our age, you'll meet people who can change something about your life, who can change the way you think about something. And you start saying, oh, now I know that I've always been wrong. Okay? You read something, And then you decide, oh, I didn't know that. Immediately, your mind changes the way it has always thought. Now, I'm sure some of you have come across the fact that at some point, everybody thought that the other was flat, isn't it? And that was acceptable. In fact, if you say, the first people who said that the other was not flat, they were killed. Did you know that? They were killed. And um, unfortunately, the people who killed them were people you would not expect that they can't kill people. They were killed by people who used to lead the church. Because the church could not stomach that somebody could say that the earth was no longer flat. It was proud. Okay, the first people who said that now they believe in Jesus Christ, they were killed. Okay, so that aspect of self-discovery, self-identity goes on in life, and some sometimes it puts you at risk. You've just discovered something new; it has changed the way you think and who you are. And then that's no longer acceptable to the people who are your friends, even sometimes even to our parents, in the most extreme of cases. Okay? Now, so, let's f uh, first of all, find out what is it that makes our identity. And there are two things that make your identity. The first one, it's known as self-concept. What's a concept? What's the definition of a concept? Any volunteer who knows what a concept is? You want to give it a try? Concept is something like a belief. Any other person who wants to try? So, what's your name? Sorry. Millie. 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 Uh, now, I want us to applaud Millie. Because she has tried. <laughs> Millie is actually right. It's a belief. But I want us to go further and say, it is an idea. So that idea in your head. 
I want us to use an example. And I will pick this guy. What's your name, sir? Evans. Evans. Yes. Now, tell me, what would you like to become in your prof as a professional? Aeronautical engineer. An aeronautical engineer? Yes. So, the guys who make all those fancy gadgets that enable us to fly. So, at this stage, Evans has an idea. He has a concept that he would like to become an aeronautical engineer. That is a self-concept. And a self-concept is defined as what you're determined to become. That belief, as Millie told us, of what you want to be. That's your self-concept. If you want to be a doctor, that's a self-concept. If you want to be a, an, an aeronautical engineer, that's a concept. If you want to be a teacher, that's a concept. It's an idea that you have in your head. Okay? Now, sometimes our concepts also include our religion. So what you believe in in terms of your religion, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, whether you're a traditionalist, that's also a concept. Okay? Those qualities, those goals okay, that you have. So, for example, there's something that probably drove Evans to decide that he wants to become an aeronautical engineer. There's something that drives that guy who wants to be a doctor. Maybe he has seen a lot of people suffering because they are not getting the right medical um, uh, management. So you might have a goal that drives you to a certain concept, to a certain belief. You might have a quality. So maybe you think you're very good in chemistry or biology or maths. And so those qualities that you have drive you to a self-concept. Other things that influence our beliefs include, for example, how we have been brought up, our own families. There are certain families whereby they believe that everybody has to become a doctor. Okay? Maybe it started with the great-grandfather. He left a clinic. Now that clinic is now managed by the, the father after being left to him by the grandfather. And then now your father wants you to inherit the clinic, so you have to be a doctor. Right? Now, that is something that is within the family that drives you to a certain uh, goal, to a certain self-concept. Now, the second bit that influences our identity is something known as self-esteem. So you said self-identity is made up of two things. So the first one that we just discussed is self-concept. And we said that is your, your belief, your idea of what you want to be in life or even what you want to achieve. Now, the second bit is the self-esteem. So, what do we understand by self-esteem? A volunteer? Yeah? What's your name? Okay, my name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel? Self-esteem is respect we have for ourselves. Can you applaud Emmanuel? Thank you very much. And that's correct. It's how we see ourselves, how we value ourselves, that self-esteem. Okay? So it refers to how people feel about those beliefs that they have. So it is linked to the first one, the self-concept. So if you want to be a doctor, how much, how much value do you put in yourself such that 
you see yourself achieving what you want to be, that self-concept, that aeronautical engineer's job, what is it that you see in yourself that makes you think you can actually make to become that aeronautical engineer? Okay. Now, what affects our self-esteem? Anything that you know that can affect your self-esteem? The value that you place on yourself? Any volunteer? You want to try? Uh -huh. Tell us your name first. My name is Peter. Mm -hmm. And what I think is our background, I mean our circumstances might make us. Mm -hmm. So where we come from, our circumstances, our background, any other thing that you think might affect our self-esteem? Hmm? People surround you. People that we surround ourselves with. In fact, those two are our biggest drivers of the value that we place on ourselves. The people around us and the environment in which we find ourselves in, our background. Okay? There are people who believe that just because of where you come from, you can never be or you can never achieve a certain goal. There are people who believe that because you come from a very poor background, you can never make a doctor. You can never make, make an aeronautical engineer. That you can never be able to start before people and tell them anything. Yeah? I'll tell you something um, about myself. Now, I come from a very humble background. I, d I don't like using the word poor. You know, you, you, you're never really poor unless you don't have any idea. It's only the people who do not have an idea that are poor. Okay? Just because you don't have the material things, you don't have the money, it does not make you poor. As long as you have an idea, that self-concept that we said, you'll always have something that you can say, well, I might not have the material things, I might not have the right background, but I know the path that I want to follow. And as long as you know that path, then you're not really that poor. So, um, out of my harbour background, I remember when I got my letter of admission to a high school. And um, in my village, the school that I went to, we were about 45 students. Out of 45 students, the only two of us who managed to get an admission um, to a good high school. Um, and I remember when I passed by my neighbors, we were schooling with one guy who was a very good friend of mine. So when I got my admission letter, I passed through his place before I went home just to tell him, well, you know, I've been admitted to this school. And when his mother had me saying that I'd been admitted to a certain this, this particular school, she asked me, are you sure your family can manage to take you there? And do you know what my question, my answer was? I said yes. Even when I had no idea how I would get to that high school. And believe you me, I went to that high school from Form 1 all the way to Form 4. So, the value that you place on yourself has a higher influence than the value that you uh, other people place on you. I'll say that again. The value that you place on yourself has a higher influence than the value that others might place on you. It is you who determines how much value you have. Not other people.
Now, I want us to take the next few minutes and look at different things that determine our self-esteem that have a very, very high influence on our self-esteem. And there are five of them. So the first one that I want us to look at is known as independence. You can call it independence. You can call it autonomy. They all mean the same thing. So becoming independent. And in terms of independence, I want us to think of it this way. That the independence that I want us to look at is that independence that makes you do things on your own fast. Okay? And also be able to think on your own. Remember we said earlier that one of the things that help us to determine our self-identity, self-determination, we said that one is what? We said, we have, we said there are three components of self-identity. One is huh? knowing who you are. The second one is knowing what you want. And the third, knowing when to do the right thing. Okay? Now, independence does not mean that you cannot be told what to do. In fact, we'll see later that there will be a lot of people in this world who think they know what is best for you. Okay? Independence is knowing what to do okay, at what time, but also being able to think on your own. And I want us to think of independence in two aspects. So you can have independence, what is known as physical independence or physical autonomy. Physical independence. So this is when, for example, you know that next week you'll be re reporting to school, right? Isn't it? But even if you have a guardian, even if you have a parent, they might not know exactly what you require. Okay? So you've got stationery, uh, you've got homework that probably you're given, um, you know, last term. Now, independence, physical independence tells you that I need to be able to arrange my stationery. I need to make sure that I have my pencils and my pen pens, my erasers, yeah, my geometrical set. Okay? Even when those things are being provided for you by other people, it is not the job of those other people to make sure that you've arranged those things in such a way that you're not going to forget them come school opening day. Right? That's physical independence. Now, physical independence also helps you to know that even if somebody is buying those things for you, you are making sure that they know you require them. Because no one else knows, right? No one else knows that you require them. Okay? So, that's physical. Then, we have another form of independence. Because we said we want to think of independence in two ways. One, that you're, you know what to do at whatever time, but you also know um, when to determine what is right and when to do it. So now, what determines when, uh, whether you're going to know um, what is right is known as psychological independence. The power to think for yourself. Psychological independence. Okay. 
So we think of psychological independence as that power that when you're given choice of different things, you know when to pick the right choice. I'll give you an example. So Ian here has some homework. Right? Now Mika doesn't have the homework. So Mika comes and tells Ian, well, why don't you we go and play somewhere? Should Ian go? They're very good friends. So he knows, Ian knows that if he tells Mika that he can't go and play, Mika won't feel very happy about it. So should Ian go and play? Should he, Emmanuel? Do you think he should go and play? Uh, I have not understand the question. Okay, so let me refresh it. They said Ian, has some homework that he needs to do. Now his friend Mika has come along and told him, well, Ian, can we go and play? They're very good friends. So uh, Ian knows that if he tells Mika they cannot go and play, Mika isn't going to be very happy. So should Ian go out and play? I think no. Uh, he can tell him that let me finish homework first before he go to play. Can you applaud uh, Emmanuel? Those are choices. So Ian has a choice to either finish his homework or go and play with his friend Mika. Now, some choices are very simple. We're going to be very faced with very simple choices. Like that one. It's a very simple choice. But there are others. As we grow up, as if, even as we make more friends, where choices are going to be harder. Where you know that when you say no, that, that person will never ever speak to you again. Yet, you want to maintain their friendship. But you know that you need to make the right choice. That is psychological independence. Knowing what choice you need to pick and when to pick it. Now, we said earlier that independence does not mean that you cannot be told what to do. Now, that is a classic example of somebody coming in and telling you what to do or suggesting something that you should do. But we have other instances whereby what you're being told to do is actually not a choice. For example, when your parent comes in and tells you, well, um, you need to clean up your room. You need to um, clean up the whole house. You need to wash your clothes or probably even the, the whole family's clothes. These are not exactly choices, right? You're being ordered. When you go to your school and you're told that this is the reporting time or this is the waking up time, that's not exactly a choice. Because if you don't do it, then there are consequences, right? But it, uh, still, it's a choice in that when you do not choose what is right, okay, you fail to choose what is right, in, in essence, you're choosing what is wrong. And we, also, we know that uh, saying, that choices are what? Choices have consequences. Because good choices will give you the good consequences. The wrong choices will also give you the wrong consequences consequences. Now, so we say that even when you have independence, especially in our age, this age of 
uh, teenagers we need in certain instances to follow only those um, choices that have gi been given to us not create our own choices okay um, I told you I, I teach in a university right I have uh, some very funny students and I hope when you come to university you will not behave like them I have students who I will give certain questions in an exam and when I get their scripts back they have written things that I know they are not answering my questions they created their own questions would you mark those questions would you mark the answers yeah I even have one who is uh, trained to be a doctor but he's always creating his own questions and answering them and I remember one day I asked him uh, let him let us give him the name of William so William why are you always answering your own questions not mine and he said Malim, you're always setting up very hard questions. So I put in the one that I have answers for. And then I asked him, now if a patient comes to you and they have uh, a wood in their leg, if you do not know how to treat that wood, are you going to treat them for a cold when they don't have a cold now we we'll have we'll have instances whereby the choices that are given to us are too difficult to choose and every time that you make a certain choice you'll find that the consequences that follow some of them are not very nice Okay. But because you remember those three aspects that we said that we talked about, I'm going to keep referring back to them. Your identity is involved involves how many things? Three, which is knowing who you are. Okay, that's very very important. Knowing who you are. The second one is knowing what you want. The third, knowing when to do the right thing. That is where we are, the choice that we make. Now, but independence is not blanket. You're not free to do anything that you want. Okay? That is because we always have boundaries. Even adults have boundaries. Now, if um, I'll call him Uncle Dongo, because he's, he's your uncle, isn't it? No? Maybe that is the title you should be giving him. No? If I were you, he would be my favorite uncle. You know, I don't get invited to a lot of places where uh, people just come and talk to me and I have some nice food. Um, I'd probably refer to that guy as my uncle. Maybe it's something you need to think about. I'm not telling you what to do. Choices, right? Choices. Everybody, when we have choices, we also have boundaries that define where those choices, those that independence reaches. Even an adult. If I came here and I start saying I'm an adult and I start I started smoking bangi, you know who would my, be my friends? Who would be my friends? You don't know. Who would really like to talk to me? I'm sure none of you would, right? Because you're making a choice. But I, I would find very good friends in uh, the guys that we call cops. They would really like to talk to me. Isn't it? Yeah, and probably take me to the free government roging. Yeah, 
and put me there for a few days or for a few months or for a few years isn't it that's a choice okay so even as we it, we exercise though that independence of making our choices we know that we have boundaries that say you cannot go past here in our school we might want to really talk to our friends but we know it is not every time that we we can exercise that choice because in class when your teacher is in or even when you're doing uh the independent study what will happen if you started talking to your friends especially in very high tones what will happen you'd li- be labeled a what and it's make isn't it and you'll get punishment for that okay it might be that you're talking about a very important thing but you e- exercise the choice at the wrong time yeah now after independence the second thing that defines our self esteem is what we call competence competence is the second thing that determines our self esteem now our friend there told us that he wants to become an aeronautical engineer a lot of us here might want to become the same but do we have the same capabilities are you good at physics i believe you have to be very good at physics to become that isn't it yeah are you good at physics personally i'm very poor in physics yeah i would uh, probably tune off if anybody spoke to me about physics but i'm i like th- thinking of myself as being competent in biology and so the choices that we make the value that we give ourselves when we say we want to become that doctor will be influenced by our capabilities competence is about capability what is it that i'm good at now i love football but give me a ball and i will if i'm trying to kick it to that guy over there or probably it will probably go in this direction and i would not know how to control it i do not have the competence to be a footballer okay competence determines our self esteem if you decided to grade me as a footballer I would, I would not score a knee. I would score a Z. Like that way down there, I would be the last. Okay? And that will affect my self esteem. It will affect the value that I place on me on myself because you have graded me in a field that I'm not competent in. There are some of you here who are very good in maths. We also some have some of you who are not so good at it but they're very good in English the spoken language the queen's language Now if I graded all of you on your competence in maths Now unfortunately maths is it's one of the required subjects in about everything isn't it Yeah and that is because maths cuts across okay so even when you want to you know if your ambition is only to go and set up that small kiosk and you shouldn't have that ambition that that you're setting the bar too low okay you need your bar needs to be here so that when you don't reach it then you can at least get here they tell you you have to aim for the sun so that if you stumble and fall you don't come back to earth you know a trist you'll be somewhere where the moon is isn't it yes set that bar very high and when you stumble and fall 
you'll never come back to earth. There'll always be some, somewhere in the middle here where you can find a footing before you start the journey. Don't set the bar too low. Because when you fall, your friend will just be the dust or the mud. Okay? So, we need to understand, to gauge within ourselves. Now, this is why we said this is self-determination. Nobody can tell you what you're good at. Only you can decide. I'm very good at maths. I'm very good in English. I am very good in sports. Because you know, you feel it within you. And that feeling is what we usually call passion. It's what drives people. It's what makes you wake up at 5 in the morning when everyone else is asleep. You're busy doing, you know, pursuing what you're very good at. It might be maths. It might be sports. Have you ever seen the, the guys who do athletics in Kenya? I'm sure you've seen a lot of them, isn't it? On TV, right? Yeah? Sometimes in our villages. What time do they train? Do you know what time they wake up to train? There was a time I used to live in, in Gong. And there was a time I was um, doing uh, some work um, at a place known as E10. And because I usually wake up very early, um, I'm usually in the office by 6.30. I used to fight them on the road. And they are not, it's not the time that they are going out. They're actually coming back. Because they know without that training, without make, you know, bettering your best, you'll never be that competent. You can never say, I'm a world champion. Okay? So, that's competence. Now, number three. We are on that road to fighting the components that determine your self-esteem. Number three is status. Establishing your status. Now this is where you make a name. Okay. This is where you make a name. What's the name of uh, that girl who topped KCSE this year? Nobody remembers? Juliet Otieno. Juliet Otieno. So when you hear Juliet Otieno being mentioned, what's a word that, what's one word that you can use to describe her? She's a champ. Any other term to describe Juliet? Any other? Uh huh. Hardworking. Hardworking. Right? But we know of her as the national champion 2018. KCSE 2018 national champion. That status. That's why she ranks. So because status is a rank, isn't it? Yeah? Is where you are, you know, in a population of 40 million Kenyans. There are about 650,000 of them who sat for KCSE. Juliet. Sia kwa Eh? Najua Kiswahili. Hata kama sio ile mzuri, sio ya kamusi. Eh? Ako hapa. Sindio? On top of everyone. Out of 650,000 people. Her status is here. Okay? So, now, for you to establish your status, there's one thing I want you to know. And I want you to carry this all the days of your life. Now, to be able to establish your status means that you cannot conform 
Do you know what is to conform? You cannot continue thinking like everyone else. Because everybody has their own rank. So our, we say that life is like a ladder. So there are people who are on top of it. Some people are in the middle. Some people are at the bottom. It does not mean that those ones who are at the bottom are the least. Okay? Or they are the lowest. No. It just means that when you start thinking of people, for example, who perform best in examinations, then that ladder will have people who will be very good at those exams. Some will be somewhere in the middle. Some will be at the bottom of that ladder. But you can pick up something else. Another talent, for example, athletics or sports. And then the people who are at the bottom of the ladder when it comes to exams will be at the top of that ladder or sports. Okay? And then those ones who are very good in exams will usually be at the bottom of that ladder. That's what it means. And that is what life is all about. Everybody has something that they can hold on to and say, this is what is going to determine my status in life. Today, for example, you might go to Kipchoge. Yeah? You know, we all know who Kipchoge is. Yeah? No? She doesn't know. What do you? Kipchoge is the world champion in marathon. Isn't it? A few days ago, he was giving, being given all these awards uh, from all over the world. In fact, a, a company based in Kenya that manufactures, manufactures the Isuzu uh, motor vehicles gave him a brand new pickup because they want him to become their ambassador. Okay? They want him, when people see Kipchoge, the world champion in marathon, they also see the Isuzu brand. Now, nobody is ever going to come to you to become the ambassador when you, have n you don't have anything to sell. I'm not talking about cabbages. I'm not talking about carrots. I'm talking about a developed, a developed current, uh, uh, talent, which when you start, people might not even remember your name. They remember your status. They remember Mika, the mathematician. They remember Emmanuel, the guy who speaks English like a European. They remember Rebecca, the girl who speaks Chinese like she was brought up in China. They remember my friend here, who is the best aeronautical engineer the world has ever seen. Now, what I want you to do from here on is go and discover what you're good at. Competence. And then use that to establish a status. Now, so that's point number three, isn't it? On self-esteem. Now, the last two before I finish. The fourth one that determines your self-esteem, somebody said, is the people around us. Peer pressure. Peer pressure determines our self-esteem. There are people who are going to, when you discover that competence, that talent that you have, that God-given talent, their role in life, and this is not God-given, is to bring you down. Tell you, when you're supposed to be here, I tell you, oh, you, you think so? Uh-uh, I doubt it. You're not that good. So I want you to be there. Because they have failed to de determine what they are good at, they failed to establish their status. Now they want you to be just like them. Okay? 
So peer pressure. And peer pressure for a lot of people, especially in our age, your age, is where everybody gets lost. Where people fail to determine what they are good at and so pursue it when they still have the energy and fail to pursue it with enough passion so that they can use it to establish their own status. And then you'll find everybody say, say, starts uh, saying, oh, I'm never good at anything. I can never amount to anything because you listened to those voices that were telling you you can never be anything. I'm telling you, everyone here, everyone among you, I can see people who can be the best in whatever you think you are good at. Whatever it is, that self-concept that we talked about earlier, that idea that you have in your head, I can be this, I can be the best lawyer in Kenya. That everybody will start thinking, oh, if I do not have, uh, who has not told me anything? You. What's your name? Sharon. Sharon. Yes. No. People will start thinking, if I do not have Sharon as a lawyer, I'm going to go to jail. Because she's that good. Okay? Peer pressure. Now, um, as I finish, because I can see um, Rosemary is starting up, I want, to, I want us to look at the... Because peer pressure, as I said, has a big, very big role. I want us to look at the role that peer pressure uh, plays. Now, I'm not saying that peer pressure is bad. Please, do not take that. We have both good aspects of peer pressure and also very bad aspects of peer pressure. There are people who, if you do not have in your life, you'll never be able to establish that status that we're talking about. They're the ones who drive you. When you just feel like, you know, things are not going too well, they give you a push and tell you, well, we are on course. Okay? Sometimes things slow down. Sometimes we don't have everything that we need to be able to determine our own competence. But as we say, that is only a bed on the road. You're still on? You're still on? On course. You're still on the right road. It is only a bed. Okay? So, some of the the things that help us as adolescents when we are in the company of good peer pressure. Okay? What would we gain in the company of good pressure? Uh, good peer pressure? We get to learn how to interact with other people in a group like this because we are all peers. Peers mean people of the same age. Okay? People that you can that have the same mentality. So we can learn how to interact with others. There are people who even if you sat next to them for two hours, they'll never say hello. Okay? There are people who could come over and help you uh, do something. But they will never utter a word because they do not have, know how to. Now, um, I think in April, we'll be doing a course on um, uh, something to do with communication. Yeah? Or we'll be talking about how do we get to be good communicators? How do you get to stand in front of people and tell them something without 
you know, drawing all those maps of Africa and Asia and Australia. How do you make sure that when you when you talk to people, you look them directly into the eye and tell them, I think you're good in maths. I think you're good in football. I think you can be good in physics. I think you can make a good doctor because you know how to treat people with compassion. Yeah? So we learn how to interact with others. Now, another advantage that we get from good uh, peer pressure, we learn how to value trust. One of the most important attributes of life is trust. And usually when you say, usually we say that when you lose trust in somebody, you don't see any more value in them. And trust is won and lost based on the values that you place on the person that you have. Sometimes you, you might even lose trust in our closest of people, our parents. Because they've done, gone on and done things that all along we would never think that a parent can do. We go on and lose trust in our guardians. We trusted them with our life. But then they go and abuse it. Okay? So when in a, in a, a peer, in, in a group, we learn how to value trust. Now, other things that peer groups also help us is to, to be able to shape our destinies. Shaping your destiny. So that person that you're very close to is the one who, is, who can see the real you. That person that you're able to open up to. Because our friends sometimes are closest interactions with the world. So they're the ones who will tell you, will come in and tell you, well, uh, Emmanuel, you shouldn't go that way. You shouldn't be doing what you're doing. It is not right. It is not right for you. Now, thi things that are right sometimes do not exactly mean that they are wrong. Can I say that again? Things that are not right does not mean that they are wrong. Because something else comes in, and that is time. Where are you within your self-identity? Like now, let me ask, is, um, is marriage right or wrong? Don't you tell me. It's right. It's right. Yes. Very well. So it is right. Would you get married now? Why? It is right. Oh, didn't you get married now? I think I have two reasons. Mm -hmm. One, for now, the time hasn't reached. And two, to me, if, as I am, it is not wrong, but it will be of no benefit. Exactly. Okay? So, it does not mean that just because something is right, it is always right. Or just because something is wrong, it is always wrong. Sometimes, or some things are determined, whether, you know, in terms of their being right or wrong, is determined by when you're doing them. That's why you said the third component of self-identity is what? Yeah? Knowing when to do the right thing. Marriage is right. But at this point in time, it is wrong. Okay? 
it will stop your self-discovery, your self-determination. Okay? So helping us to shape our destinies, when we are doing the, right, the wrong things, somebody will come in and say, well, you shouldn't be doing that. When you're doing the right thing, we'll get what are known as commendations. Somebody will commend us for having done the right thing. Okay? Now, something else that you gain from peer groups is that they help you to go back and establish, uh, establish that first bit that we talked about, the independence. So they help you to establish your autonomy, your independence. They help you with free thinking. Okay. They help you to know when, for example, to start practicing that, what we said is the first bit of independence, which is, we call it the physical, physical autonomy. Okay. When do I start preparing for something that is coming up? When do I start preparing for my exams? Is it a day before the exam? The night before? When do I do my assignments? Do I start remembering them the morning before they are due for heading in? And then I start going to my friends and telling them, oh, can I have you as I copy? Yeah? So if you are in the right group, you'll even have timelines. They will tell you, well, uh, we have an assignment that is due on Tuesday next week. Can you find some time and we do it today? Yeah? When you're revising, you'll have somebody to go to and help you. For example, in the revision. Maybe there's a, a certain concept that you do not understand very well. Okay. And then finally, they help us to build friendships. Peer groups help us to build friendships. There are people here that will tell you that they have childhood friends. People they grew up with when we were, they were toddlers. And even now, they are still very, very tight friends. Now, a lot of other people that are, are our friends, we've gained those friendships or built those friendships as we grew along. I always tell people that um, some of my best friends, um, they're not even from my tribe. A lot of them are, are not even Kenyans. Okay. You know, there are people that have built those friendships as I grew along. Okay? There are people that I met in a group like this. And then we became so tight because we found that we have common values. We like, you know, the same things. Okay? We have passion for certain things. Okay? Now, recently I met Rosemary and Uncle Dongo, right? Now, they're my friends. Okay. We met, well, in a group like this, though smaller. But because we found that we share some values, then we came together. Okay. So, that's very, very important in, in life. Now, how do we determine who would be our good peers and who our bad peers would be? How do we determine those groups that we can follow and those ones that we shouldn't? Now, this comes back to self. And that is why we said the most important aspect about self-identity is self-concept. What do you want to be? What do you want to achieve in life? And then that second bit of self-esteem. What value do you place on yourself? That's what determines what groups you can form, what friendships that you, you find ideal. And I use um, an acronym known as PAID. So P-A-I, but instead of one D, you have two Ds. And I'll tell you what they mean. So P, the first P, or the only P, 
stands for picking friends who can provide peer power picking friends who can provide peer power that's what p stands for and that means that you even before you bring somebody very close to you making them your confidant listening to them and doing you know letting them influence your decisions you have to judge how much peer power they have over you what shared values do you have now a starts for assertiveness assertiveness No, assertiveness is um sometimes it is misused because assertiveness means power or force. But that's not what I want us um I, I want it to mean for us today. So assertiveness I want to think of it as this way that you will have power or force to independently determine what you want out of your peer um out of your peers without disrespecting them okay you can say no without telling the other person off okay you have to make sure that you do not have hurt the other person's feelings as you tell them well i do not think that is right or you know i don't i don't want you as a friend or go away and never come back okay you, you you never know when you might need that person again okay so you can be assertive you can be forceful so you make sure that your values are known without hurting the other person's feelings okay we also we also have to know that we are all different we have different qualities we have different ambitions and that other person might actually be meaning well for you only that they do not exactly know your values okay so that's for a then i is ignore i starts for ignore Now we see that there are, you can get into groups whereby people are going to try and influence you because peer groups are about influence they're about making sure that when you get into that group you do as what the other members of the group do okay and so there are a lot of groups that do recruitment recruitment is getting new members in okay sometimes that is done even without knowing okay so these two guys here for example might be having a group and they have certain activities and then they try and they want ian in that group but ian does not like some of the activities that are happening within the group maybe they are very good at football but then after football they have to go and smoke a cigarette ian doesn't want to start smoking right So I says that when you have that kind of influence in a group that has values that you do not share you can ignore them. And now now most times they get tired of trying to recruit into their group and they will go away. Okay? And they will never disturb you again. Okay? Now but you also have groups or members of groups who are very influential and uh, once you you know you decline the offer of joining their group then they'll start making jokes are you they'll start um making some not so funny jokes yeah um 
I remember when we were in high school and people wanted you to take, they, they used to call it, I don't know what they call it nowadays, but they used to ask you to take a puff. Yeah? So that, you know, one drug on, on the cigarette. And if you decline, they will start calling you a sissy. Yeah? We do not find uh, being called a sissy very, very nice. Um, now, young men, when they are told that they are like their sisters, it doesn't sound very nice. You want to feel, you know, want somebody to recognize that you are a man. Okay? So, D, the first D, starts for diffuse. Diffuse is spelled D-I-F-F-U-E-S. And Diffuse says, well, make a joke out of it. See the funny side of something. Okay? When somebody, you know, says that you're a sissy, say, say, oh, yeah, you know, and I'm, I have no problem with it. And then they have nothing else to throw at you. Because they would expect you to react in a way that, you know, would probably make them make them show you how manly they are so d is to, for diffuse and then the last one the last d is the most important part the last d stands for defining and remembering your values because they are the ones that are going to guide you into either being able to ignore being able to diffuse, being able to identify the big group, the, the good groups that you'd like to join, and being able to say no to when to those things that do not add value to what you want to become. And with that, I want to add my story about self determination, self identity. But before I add, I want to ask that we all remember those three aspects that define self-identity. And I want to ask us that we stand, okay, and then I'm going to ask us that we all shout very loudly those three key aspects for self-identity. So can we all stand, please? So let's start. Number one of self-identity. Ah, that's not shouting. Number one of self-identity. That's better. Number two. Number three. Thank you very much. And God bless you.